Hi everyone, this is Dr. O, and in this video, we're going to talk about the oval and the round windows. And specifically, where are the oval and the round windows, and how do they function in hearing? Now you'll remember this image from the very first um, video of this series, showing the different walls. So from this, we are standing in the middle ear, looking toward the medial wall with the tympanic membrane at our backs. What we can see is the point where the stapes will contact the oval window. So this foot plate of the stapes contacting the oval window. Now we can't necessarily see it here because it is full of covered by the foot plate of the stapes. But this is the point where the ossicle chain will then communicate into the vestibule and onwards toward the cochlea. Now just inferior to the oval window, we find the round window. And this will be important in terms of fluid expansion from the cochlea. I'm going to use this kind of schematic to talk through how this works. So first off, I just want to orient you with everything we're looking at here. Uh, so this is a cross section. So imagine the snail shape of the cochlea, cut in a cross section so you can see all of this is a membranous lined fluid filled compartment. So you'll remember in the external ear leading into the middle ear we're in air filled spaces. Now we're moving into a fluid filled space. Okay so near where that oval window will be is right at the point of the vestibule and then leading around here is the cochlea. And then just inferior to the oval window is where we find the round window. So you'll see that this is labeled lateral and we'll remember we were looking from this view. We were standing over here where this mouse is looking at the oval window and the round window in the last image. And the oval window will receive the foot plate of the stapes. So sound energy reaches the oval window from the ossicles through the stapes. This leads to pressure waves being generated through the fluid. So this fluid, this area right in here, you can imagine sort of a directional pressure wave. Now what happens is then eventually this pressure wave will reach this innermost point of the cochlea and turn on itself to then go back out the other direction. So if we follow these purple arrows, that follows there. So as you can see here, these pressure waves moving through these outer portions in light blue that contain what's called perilymph leads to movement of the fluid within the cochlear duct, which is called endolymph. Now the round window comes into play here as we think about the functioning. So you've pushed these pressure waves along the way and to dissipate or allow for this expansion, this round window will expand into the air-filled middle ear. So this will dissipate the pressure waves from the fluid within the cochlea and out into the air-filled space of the middle ear. Now what happens with movement of the fluid in the cochlear duct is quite complex. And we're not going to get into the specific parts of it in this um, course, but you'll see a little bit more about it in your neuro course uh, in the future. But for now, what we wanna think about is we see movement of fluid, and this leads to movement of specific membranes within that cochlear duct. And on those membranes, we have hair cells. And the hair cells, when they are pushed over, trigger an action potential. And this neural action potential will then travel from these hair cells out through the vestibulocochlear nerve. Now what's really interesting, and not something that I'm interested in assessing you on, and similarly the details of the perilymph and endolymph um, is not necessarily important for this course. But what is very interesting, um, I think, is that 
as waves come through, the shorter the waves, think more high pitched, the sooner we'll see the activation of the membrane leading to the action potential. Then if it's a longer kind of lower pitched wave, that won't trigger until we get further distally within the cochlea. All right, so here's a question to help assess ourselves following from the oracle all the way to the vestibulocochlear nerve. So follow the pathway of sound and list all the structures in the way. So definitely pause it so you have a moment to write out as many as you can. And then when you're ready, check back in. So let's start with the sound. So here we'll say it's a speech bubble. Someone is saying, hi. Maybe it's me at the beginning of every single one of my videos. So this is then brought in either through your earbuds or through this structure. What is that one called? So that is the oracle or the pinna. Now this leads into this structure here. The canal is called the external acoustic meatus. Now from there, that will lead to vibrations or movement of this structure here in green, which is the tympanic membrane. All right, now from there, we're going through the ossicles. So which one first? First we see malleus, then incus, and then finally, stapes. Now where stapes meets the next portion is this structure right here. What is that called? So that is the oval window. Now the oval window leads us into the next part. What is this portion called? Kind of right around in here. So that is the vestibule. Now the vestibule then leads into this structure here, which is the cochlea. Now within the cochlea, we see movement of what here? Let's go very broadly here and say fluid. Now, this movement of fluid leads to movement of fluid within a particular part of the cochlea called the cochlear duct. And within the cochlear duct, we find the organ and the hair cells that detect this movement, and those will then lead to an action potential through cranial nerve eight, or the vestibulocochlear nerve. So we can see represented here, coming together with this one, that all would be cranial nerve eight. Now, again, let's revisit, we're thinking fluid. Now, fluid is not compressible, so eventually it does have to dissipate somewhere. Those pressure waves will come out through which structure then? So here, we see the pressure waves will dissipate into the air through the round window. So I hope some of these things are starting to come together. And just a little, you know, humor moment for us. I'm going to pause and let you read it because I don't want to ruin the magic of this comic with my potentially not great impression of adorable little stapes here. But how accurate is this, though? Like, it just makes me very excited. This, this is an Awkward Yeti comic, and I highly recommend you look at all of the comics by this person. 
um, because they are not only accurate, but they're adorable. So stapes, smallest bone in the body, projects, we're getting vibrations from malleus, incus, and then stapes, and going to the oval window. Yay! And they're adorable, okay? Now, something I've proposed for a little while is an addition to this, potentially a whole part two, but I'm not the comic here, so I just I just wanted to include a little side note here. So here's our stapes from the blue link image, of course, and we've got a bit of a, a difference in story here, because all of a sudden we see this red line projecting here, which is representative of a muscle. And Stapes is saying, oh no! So what is that muscle? Let's get all academic on this adorable comic. That muscle is Stapedius really holding down, kind of controlling the Stapes a little bit. I mean, yes, all your auditory uh, perceptions are still at the mercy of Stapes, but, you know, there's a little bit of uh, checks and balances going on here. Right? And, you know, why not? I also drew in the nerve. So, what's the nerve here? We have the nerve to Stapedius, and what's it a branch of? Cranial nerve. Seven. Awesome. All right. Well, that was a fun side note. All right. So, that's the end of this video. If you need a little break or a little laugh in your life, definitely check out The Awkward Yeti. Lots of wonderful comics that I cannot get enough of. But if you have any questions at all about this material or you want to send me an Awkward Yeti comic, feel free to reach out to me and I will see you in the next video.